So, first things first, uh, tell me about this match. What would you like to learn? What did uh, you think went wrong? What did you think went right? We'll turn this it was a, a lane I've never... Well, I might have played it once, but like... It's against the uh, QE Invoker. Um, I get sent to spawn way more than usual. Um, and I feel like I stayed pretty relevant, but the side lanes had a way harder time, I think, than I was realizing. I didn't get to do much for them. Um, and yeah, it felt like I was relevant, but not really able to do a whole lot. And I pinned in. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it does happen a lot. Dota, especially recent Dota, what I've noticed myself is your, your, you as a player, your personal impact matters a lot less than it was like years ago. That myself, actually. It's, um, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you why, <laughs> but uh, it, do, it does feel like, um, let's say you have a, a, a new player on your team or whatever, it does feel like that makes a lot more difference than somebody really knowing what they're doing. Yeah, well, good news is that the lower on the MMR scale you go, the easier it is to still have some uh, good solo carrying impact. So yeah, uh, we'll go over this game, outline some key facts on how, <coughs> sorry, on how okay. in, this, in, in this MMR players can basically have more impact to actually solo carry games. The higher you go, the less of an Im impact you will have, but uh, since this is a 1k MMR range, there, there are a lot of things we can abuse to yeah. give ourselves more space as a team and lose opponents. Mm. I suppose at a higher rank you need to solo carry less because there's more teamwork anyway. Right, so first let's go over the landing phase. I don't, I don't think I'll talk about it too much. I mean, this is 1k laning, so I I will just expect 1k laning. I'll just outline some key mistakes I, I might be noticing and you might not be noticing. Yeah, this, this first wave's a bit rough for me, um, but other than that, it's kind of back to normal. Usually I would say uh, every every free moment you get, you should hit your opponent, but that's a QE invoker, he regens a lot, so that's not very feasible. If you cannot hit your opponent, in that case, you should always hit your creeps in preparation to snipe them with the remnant. Yeah. Which is what's going on, so well, good, well, good. Except, uh, uh, your focus should always be on the ranged creep. So yeah, ide ideally, uh, this this wave, the way you should have played is you just move and hit the ranged creep first thing you see. And after three, three or four hits, you drop a remnant and finish it off. Okay. Like right now, but I see I... I see your attention is on the me middle melee creep of the enemy team, and that's and that's pretty much a reaction. You see it low, and you move in to prepare to take care of the slow creep. But instead of a reactionary movement movement in the mid lane, you should be doing uh, actionary movement in the mid lane. If that makes sense. Which means mm -hmm. you should look for opportunities and make them happen. So in that case, instead of seeing a creep that is low and making it, moving in to kill it, you should see a creep that is not low, the range creep, which is very volatile creep. And what I mean by that is that any second invoker pulls aggro, the range creep will be the one in focus, and you'll have harder time taking it. So it, in the case like this, the, the the pull was good. It's in the high ground. In the cases like this, you have every every opportunity to cleanly take down this range creep so yeah for your your first attention in the first wave always should be on the range creep yeah i feel like i messed this one up quite hard even as i was playing it i was like right right now i'm looking not at range creep now i'm looking at it and i've realized it's too late it's... yeah yeah by the time you actually react to it it's too late yeah and the way you should play this is you should always have that in mind even before stuff happens to it Well, still, three creeps is good. It's, it's not the worst case scenario. Yeah, and that's exactly what you did, <laughs> what I talked about, you did in, in the second wave. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. Like, my first wave was a bit rough, yeah, yeah. but okay. it's like... Uh... I mean, so far the landing is good. You seem to know the key principles to it. Yeah, I've done it 400 times. <laughs> 
You even hit a tower way more than I do. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I felt like hitting the character would draw the aggro and risk me getting hit. No, that's very good. If, if, you're, if you're not hitting the hero, if you're not hitting the creeps, then hit a tower. <laughs> what the <Yeah>. hell? <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Welcome to 1k. Uh, um, he, he, he did bait you into taking tower hits. <laughs> yeah, that's totally what happened there. <laughs> that was a um, 500 IQ move you fell for. Mm-hmm. Entirely unpredictable. Right, 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 right. L look at this. Look at this here. You're going in to what I assume is stack the creeps. Yeah. But there is a big, fat, juicy range creep just coming your way waiting to be killed. And the tower is taking care of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I suppose could have got both of them pretty easily there. You should, yeah, 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 yeah. There were no reason that you couldn't take care of this one first and then and then went to stack. This camp is really easy to stack. You can always show up at the last second, like like 56 second mark, and just hit it. The radiant camp is a bitch and is pretty much unstackable. I have no problem with it. I pull it down the stairs normally. Yeah, if you're going for the rune, yes, but if, if you want to return to the lane, then it's quite impossible. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've never even bothered to pull it that way. Okay, now this is a very bad habit, which you should basically avoid making. As soon as you take the rune, do not walk through the river. It basically yeah. opens you up for free harassment. That's like the worst movement you can make in the mid lane. Walking back through the river when the opponent is free to harass you like that. I think there again I was uh, positioning wrong for the range creep, tower takes it. If the invoke was better he would have denied me as well. You can see that. Another note is you should never prioritize runes unless you're like really low or the opponent is really low and it's a question of denying the rune. But right now you're both quite healthy, there is no reason for you to walk out of the lane and miss creeps. I mean if Invoker was smarter he would have aggroed all of the creeps and denied his ranged one. Yeah. So always clear the way first, then take a walk if needed. Okay. This felt like quite a poor laning stage for me in a in, in a bit. He keeps hitting me with uh, tornado EMP, and I just keep going back to spawn. Like uh, yeah, that's, I can't that's afford what, the region. That's what invokers do. Now let's take mm -hmm. a pause for a moment to discuss the skill build. Usually you take vortex if you plan on trading hits with the enemy, but I think you, you full know, full well know that Invoker is not a hero you can trade versus. Especially QW. Yeah, because of that, because of the huge region. Invoker is uh, what we call a farm lane, because he cannot really be killed unless you have way higher skill than the opponent, or you get the roams, or he makes very obvious mistakes. In farm lanes, you shouldn't uh, waste a point on Vortex. An earlier point in the Remnant will help you secure range creeps more easily. An overload, it would do the same, but you would be from a safer distance. Basically, against farm lanes, you should skip Vortex until like level 5 or even 7. Okay. Never got it at 7, I've always got it at um, before 6. And again, you, you were taking a walk just as the range creep was being beaten down. Yeah, look this, at that time I've done that. I, I feel this is a, quite a habit you have, so the sooner you try to get rid of this habit, the better climbing experience you will have. Yeah, I mean, um, it's quite an easy thing to fix, isn't it? Just look yeah, at the, it's look easy at the range one. <laughs> So yeah, he keeps shaming you off from the lane. So, it is it is completely okay to not even participate in the laning stage if you have the option to jungle, like you're doing right now. This is good. It's also a really good habit. If you cannot lane, then just don't lane, because there's way more to lose if he keeps shoving you to the base, like you said. Level 4 onwards, especially if you have skipped vortex, you can, you can pretty easily stay in the jungle. That's one of the storm's main strengths. He can jungle very easily. Yeah, I I didn't feel um, bad about hopping into the jungle every now and again at all. Uh, it's like 
if it's just more trouble than it's worth to be on lane, it, it's super easy. Yeah, this is another bad habit you will need to phase out. Just because you can use the Vortex combo doesn't mean you should, because uh, looking back at it, I'm sure if you I'm look back at it yourself, I mean, what does that accomplish? You're just losing mana. He's not in danger of dying. It's just you saw the opportunity, you took it without even thinking. Is that accomplishing anything? It does not. If, if it does not, then it's just not worth going for it. Okay. I mean, yeah, against, like I said, against weaker opponents or people that don't know what they're doing. It, it might work, you might get a super lucky kill, but 99% of the time you're just wasting mana for nothing. Mana, which you would be better using in the jungle, because this matchup is unfavorable to you. <laughs> I felt it was pretty unfavorable. Uh, I normally play against um, QE invokers, and that's pretty straightforward. But, yeah, QW kind of threw me. Yeah, but looking back, 50% of what of why this matchup is unfavorable is is your actions. You keep coming back, you keep missing creeps. As you can see, the Voker is having pretty good time with uh with the wave always on his high ground, and you're just coming in and making yourself a perfect target. So yeah, let me just repeat myself again. If if the lane is in bad position, just don't even come here. Go to jungle. There is no set rule that defines that you should stay in the mid lane to win the mid lane. Juggling is fine. Especially if you're going for Soul Ring, which is like the ultimate jungle item. Yeah, it's something I've been doing recently. Instead of um, rushing Orchid with Soul Ring Treads, I'm really liking it. If I have an Orchid, I feel like loads of pressure to abuse my timing and my map knowledge isn't that well, map awareness isn't great, so I end up like rushing a 3.5k item, making a bad gank, and then having to recover. <laughs> it's just a. Uh, I'd rather farm a car here. Yeah. Yeah, that is the nature of Dota. Yeah. Okay, gonna make a stack. Cool. Even with the bad lane, you're still 200 gold ahead of the invoker, so all is well. I feel like I wouldn't be against a better player. True, he would punish you more, because yeah. you, you did upward open up yourself for a lot of punishing opportunities. One of the things to abuse my way out of this rank. Yeah. Right, I think I'm gonna just fast forward a bit this part. We have discussed pretty much everything. Yeah. Looking back at it, when you pointed it out, to see how much I've been like ignoring range creeps. Like, if I was trying to teach a new player to play, I would tell them focus on the range creep entirely, and that's just not what I'm doing. Yeah, looking back is always pretty insightful, especially if you have a third party like helping you notice things that you wouldn't be looking for normally. Although range creeps yeah. are pretty easy things to look for. Right, uh, anyway. Uh, just gonna repeat myself again here. Invoker is really not a hero you should try to kill. Because 90% of the time it will not happen, you'll just, you'll be just wasting mana. If that was a Zeus, go for it. If that's Invoker, Huskar... I mean, I feel you wouldn't even try to kill Huskar, so I'm not really sure why you're trying to kill Invoker. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just run away from Huskar. Yeah, so treat the Volker same as Huskar. Okay. Heroes. That's good to know. Yeah, I mean, heroes. Heroes which have, like, defense mechanisms to disengage, like Ember, Void Spirit at level 6. They are not really much killable. Same with Volker. He has so much, so much tools to 
to disengage from your gank or turn it around. You're just every single attempt you make is is making you waste mana. I'll bear that in mind because I, I see invoke it quite a lot. So to uh, to be able to just like bin him off as a farm lane would be quite nice. Yeah, you see invoker, there is no pressure for you to kill him. I mean, why are you so bent on killing him? What what does that give you? And yeah, you're just like, this is like your fifth attempt to fight Volker. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem to learn from these attempts. It's just yeah. like, uh, you go to the lane, you try to kill him, and like, whoopsie, I guess I'll go again in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I feel um, like I definitely felt like I was, I was spending a whole lot more time and resources on things like uh, than I would normally be. I think that's just because... How much he regens, and uh, you're right. I've I've just you just keep doing it. Your entire early game is spent trying to kill Volker. That's the keyword trying. It's not like you're making <laughs> yeah. any progress. It's not like you're growing stronger or hitting any power spike, which would help you kill it. You're just you seem to have this mindset that if there is an opposing mid laner, you should try to kill it, which is again a very bad mindset to have. Next time you're in a game, when you're like, during the pick phase, during the, uh, before the game starts, when you're walking down the runes, just ask yourself this question, is the opposing mid laner something I can kill? Is it something I can kill during the laning stage, after level 6, before level 6? And you would, you would, you would be surprised how easy it is to deduce whether you can or can't. Like I said, obvious example is Huskar. Like, you see Huskar, you know you're not killing him. You see Viper, you know you're not killing him. Same with Invoker. You see Invoker, you should know you're not killing him. If you have concluded that you're not killing the opposite mid laner, what you do, you, have a you set yourself a mindset of a farm lane, and you just forget about trying to kill him. And this will give you like 1k MMR immediately, because Instead of spending gold, resources, everything on trying to kill the mid laner, what happens instead is that you're farming jungle, you're getting items, and the enemy mid laner is not farming you. Yeah. Okay. You see, uh, <laughs> the problem is, if uh, I do that like uh pre-game check and i would have told you like oh yeah i'll kill lane invoker so <laughs> I, I guess i'm just wrong on that um which is unfortunate but um yeah that's good knowledge to have yeah, which is a bit surprising to me like you you said yourself that you're facing a lot of invokers and yet here you are doing six six drive-bys attempting to kill him and see so I, I just gotta ask, were the previous invokers allowing you to kill them? Why are you still bent on killing him? Um, I've never really found any problem against invoker. Um, this one is definitely the, the one I've sucked the most against. Right, so let me tell you right here and now, as you climb a mar, every single invoker will be like that. It's not a kill lane. Yeah. Uh, I, I will just uh... yeah. That's the yeah, biggest. That, the that's the biggest change. That's the biggest uh, MMR gaining change you can walk away from this replay analysis with. Recognize farm lanes and farm. Okay. Yeah, and now that network has been updated, we can see the difference of the result of your actions. It's been a 10, <laughs> yeah. you've got 3k, and he's got 4.6. All because you, key, you kept coming back to kill him. If you would have farm jungle, you would have easily had as much as him. Like, 3k should be your score, net worth score, against heroes that can actually punish you for laning, like Huskar or Viper. In Wilker, if you just jungle, if you hit things under tower, he has no real kill potential on you. You don't have kill potential on him, but he doesn't have kill potential on you. Okay. 
All right, attempt number eight. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm not surprised I didn't just zip in. Yeah. This is good to know because I felt like I was in um, such a like a um, up against the wall. Like I was like, wow, I just can't kill this guy. I can't. Uh, I can't pressure him out of lane. I can't. You know, I, I, I guess it hadn't really occurred to me at the time. You can just like 50-50 the lane, see how much money you can get. Yeah. Uh, one more note I can make here. One more thing you can think about is that if a uh, really good mindset to have is that if you cannot make plays in the mid lane, you can always attempt to make plays in the side lanes. Uh, right now in this draft, it's not very feasible because Jagger is not very killable without you wasting your entire mana pool, so that ain't good. And same with Slardar. This match is not a good example, but if the enemy, for example, had a Monkey King in the safe lane, He's such a juicy snack compared to Invoker that every single yeah. time you would teleport middle to get Invoker, I would say, why not kill Monkey instead? Monkey dies super easily to Storm. And your offlaner can farm middle in the meanwhile. So not only are you trading resources, not only are you shutting down their carry, your offlaner is still farming. Uh, in the... In your safe lane, if the offlaner was someone like a, I don't know, Wind Ranger, if the enemy care, if your carry can bait out Wind Run, she also dies super easily. So yeah, uh, just something to think about is that if you cannot make plays in the mid lane, you can always make plays in the side lanes. Worst case scenario, you continue to farm jungle. Uh, yeah, this game I I uh, only make really like one rotation, and it's to try and save Slark, and it ends up being kind of just a mess. Um, but uh, yeah, if if in a game I was going for like Orchid, I'd definitely be thinking about where I can uh, go to the side a bit more. I think this game I was kind of all over the shop a bit. Yeah, that's the thing. Storm is not reliant on Orchid to make plays. All you need to have is a good understanding of heroes, what you can kill, what you can't kill. In my last, uh, I don't know, 50 games of Storm, I haven't gone Orchid first at all. I'm going, uh, now I'm going Kaya first, and it does not prevent me from having impact. In the early game I still have stats like uh, 7 kills, 1 death and some assists, because I'm not reliant on Orchid. I'm reliant on hero understanding, of understanding where I can make plays. So same same advice I would I would tell you is that as you're farming, as you're playing, if you think about what heroes on the map you can kill. Yes, some heroes are absolutely killable only with Orchid, but also so are the others killable without Orchid. Worst case scenario, you're still farming, your game impact is still there because you're getting items. Best case scenario, you can still make rotations with the rune, with your team, and get kills because you are Storm, and not because you're a hero who has Orchid. In this match, I can see you have a pretty good understanding of rotations. It's like you go to the wave, Wave is clear to go to the jungle. So this part is good. Yeah, if only I've been doing that from minute one instead of... Mm, let's go kill Invoker. This part is good only because there there are no plays to be made in the side lanes. And even better suggestion I would give you in these games is that since you are so evidently overwhelmed by Invoker's aggressiveness you could let Tide, you could let one of the supports just uh, sit in the mid lane, soak some experience, get whatever last hits they can. You can trade lanes with your off lane, with, oh there we go.
Yeah, I remember thinking like, um, well, I've just spent all of my mana again, but I cannot go back to spawn. That would kind of just cripple me more. Yeah, I'm not is, proud of that rotation. This is the worst <laughs> worst case scenario kind of rotation <laughs> yeah. to do as a mid laner. Yeah. Okay, in so, my mind, so, it was. Yeah, please continue. Uh, it was. It was. Um, Pos one's getting dived. I'm not doing much here. Um, and then as soon as I was TPing, I was like, wow. I'm not going to achieve anything at all there. Um, but, yeah. Right, right, right. Anyway, to finish my previous sentence is that if mid lane is giving you a hard time, there is no reason for you to come, to come back to it. You can either abandon it completely, because you will still farm faster in the jungle, or best case scenario, you can let one of your other cores or the supports rotate and just salvage what they can. From what what we have seen so far, the things you can conclude yourself is that staying in the lane just means Invoker is inevitably going to trade their mana. You're losing more staying in the mid lane than you're gaining not staying in the mid lane. Now on to the rotation. <laughs> Dyer's middle tower is under attack. Stupendous! Dyer's middle tower Every single rotation you have to ask yourself, what will you gain by making that rotation? Uh, in mm -hmm. this case, is your carry in immediate danger? I would um. say he is not, because Lardar is alone. I would assume that Slark is low on health because Slardar has used his spells and Slardar's spells are now on cooldown. That's a logical deduction to make, which concludes yeah. to that the fact that Slark would probably just run away and your, in, your, your inter, intervening is not really necessary. Yeah. Now, if you were to just jump Snapfire, kill Snapfire and take over the, sa the safe lane while Slark runs away, that would be a good rotation because you're still getting a kill slark is still not in danger and you have now and you now have a lane to farm in but you yeah. attempting to kill slardar would mean you're just wasting your entire mana pool because of how far away he is slark cannot help you in this scenario so best case scenario you're maybe 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 getting a kill most likely dying or going back to base with zero mana. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, in, in the future matches, if you would just pause and think back to moments like these, you gotta ask yourself, what am I gaining from making this rotation? And what's the best approach to, if you decide to make such rotation, what is the best best approach to making this work? And right now, Killing Snapfire and taking over the lane while Slar goes to base is pretty worthwhile. Trying to save Slark that doesn't need saving is not. Yeah. And now we have we both have to get on back. Radiant are scanning. Dyer's top tower is under attack. Dyer's top tower is falling. And another pretty pretty easy factor to determine how how your rotations would be beneficial is just look at the scoreboard. Right now it's uh, 13 to 1, which tells you that the enemies are pretty damn strong and your team is in no shape to fight. So unless you have big ultimates to spare with Tidehunter, uh, very likely your rotations 
will not be of high impact because how fat the enemies are and how little your teammates can contribute. In, in, such, in such cases, you are playing from behind and your main focus should not be rotations, it should be farming. Okay. Again, unless the enemy is playing carelessly or you have some big ultimates. It's not a rule, but it's a good guideline, guideline to go by. Yeah, it sounds obvious. Um, I haven't really thought about that, though. It seems that everyone in this team is really horny for invoker. Yep. I think they just see um Ooh, middle. Go kill him. A lot of games it does feel like five v five deathmatch. There we go. Finally After happened. 17 minutes, yeah. <laughs> Which is good. You did finally saw a good opening to get him down. Yeah, shame I couldn't... Uh... So yeah, and let's... One. Let's let's pause for a moment and... Try to think about the state of the game. Which is something you would need to do in game yourself anyway. Right, so the scoreboard is still looking pretty horrible. You know, <laughs> you know your team has very little space to operate in. There are basically no vision, no safe places to go by. And everyone is under constant threat of being attacked. Because Boker is, has Orchid, they have every means to invade your, your team's safe space. So let's try to conjure up a game plan where we're playing from behind, which would be the most optimal scenario. Okay. You should identify the strongest player, which would help you win team fights, or maybe even a hit squad. So obviously tied with his ultimate is pretty good. Once you have Ravage as a team. Once you have Ravage as a team, you should ask, or maybe just buy smoke yourself, go for smoke, try to make use of this Ravage. Because it will most likely be a successful smoke gank with the Ravage, provided you are approaching the enemy team as a team of 4 or 5. But just uh, wandering around all five of you in different places, allowing yourselves to get get picked off, is not optimal. Is not the optimal way. And the way you can think about this ki these kind of scenarios is that if you don't see Invoker, and naturally Slardar because now he has Blink. If you don't see the enemy players, which have a really easy time engaging on you, you should be very conscious about where you are standing on the map. If you don't see them, you should play near towers, play under whatever vision you still have. If you do see them, if for example you see them in the middle, what does that tell you? Tell you? That tells you that side lanes are currently free to farm in. This is important, why? Because uh, in playing from behind you should still make use of what little space you have. So the cores, you and Slark, if they see an enemy initiator on one lane, they should make their best effort to play in the lane where they are not. Because not only are you still getting farm, safe farm, because you know that enemy team will be sticking together, you're also pushing out the lanes, which is natural space maker. But right now what I see in this match is just all five of you are just congregating in the middle and none of the sides are being pushed. So it's a it's a good habit you have 
So to summarize, if you're playing from behind, if the enemy is really good at catching you, and if you can deduce that enemy will play as three, four, or five men his squads, try to be conscious about where you are, and your main target would be farming the side lanes. Again, the, the exception to this is if the enemy is quite carelessly running alone through your vision, or if you have big ultimates like Tide. Uh, like I was, I was aware that we had to be playing from behind, but I did feel like pretty clueless as to how to best do it. I mean, kills are okay, but in this particular match, those kills come with a really huge risk factor, because any. Every single player in the, in the enemy team, except for maybe Chuggernaut, can kill you solo, provided uh, they have good stun lock. Mm. I mean, to be honest, this match was doomed from the start. Because not only you have personally wasted so much uh, time and space in the middle, the side lanes have also lost which uh, leads to a pretty easy conclusion that even if you did have good time in the mid lane, even if you did not waste time on the invoker, the invoker would still have farmed because your side lanes were broken. Yeah, this... Um, it happens enough in my games that I would, I'd be kind of looking for advice on how to, um, how to stall a game so you can come back. But, um, yeah, sidelines. <laughs> yeah, these kind of games are pretty much auto-losses. Nothing you can do about it happens in my games as well. Uh, uh, the, the things we talked about, they wouldn't help here as much as they would help in the cases where the sidelines were not as crushed. If, for example, the sidelines won, or one of the sidelines won, and the enemy does not have such a free roam on the entire map. So while while I don't have any advice to win this particular match, because it does look pretty unwinnable, unless you would uh, unless you like five, six K MMR. But in the closer matches, closer kind of matches, by applying the same principles you could theoretically solo win the game. Okay. And that's that would look like um, just being in a side lane, uh, lane, jungle, lane, jungle, lane, jungle, as opposed to constantly scrapping in the mid lane. I yeah. Think. As long as you think about what you can do and where you can do, consciously thinking about it, you would naturally come to the conclusion to where your hero is the most profitable playing in, what heroes you can kill, and if you cannot kill the heroes, which lane is the most easy to make impact in, that would naturally make space to you and your team. Okay. Well, I don't think we can squeeze anything more out of this particular match. Do you have questions? Um... Would ha having rotated more earlier, as in like, give up on uh, Invoker and just go kill Juggernaut a couple times, do you reckon that would have changed the matchup enough to make it winnable? Likely no, because like we have oh. talked before, this matchup, this match is really bad on the sideline kind of things, because in order to actually kill either Juggernaut or Slardar, their other course, you would have to waste your entire mana pool because of how easy is it, how easy it is for them to disengage. So it, it, it is it is doable. Game. It is doable. But if the enemy mid would choose to rotate, your gang is suddenly turned around, and it is you who would die. It's basically mm -hmm. high risk, low reward. In the match yes. like this, in, in matches similar to this where you cannot make plays in the middle lane or the side lanes, just AFK in the jungle.
Okay. Um, yeah, if this this replay is a bit a uh, bit done, what do you recommend? Oh, sorry, was that a question? Yeah, like, uh, should we watch a different one? Or, um, like you said, there's not much to squeeze out of this one. Well, I mean, the, the, for this replay, yeah, we are concluded. Okay, cool. Um, I've got... I haven't really got many others at the moment that we could watch. I've got, um, maybe one, but... It's not really a great replay. No, it's fine. I mean, you can still apply the concepts you you may have learned here for your games, and then uh, grab a new replay, replay to analyze. Okay. So yeah, um, if you have nothing else, I think this session is concluded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, suits me. Alrighty.